So without any further delay, I want you to get John chapter 9. I don't want to use all my time making announcements. John chapter 9, and I just want to read these verses to get started, and then we'll have a word of prayer. John chapter 9, verse 31. John chapter 9, verse 31, it says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Come over to Romans chapter 10. By the way, stick something in that because we're going to come back there. Uh, go over to Romans chapter 10 if you would and look at verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Now, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Dearly Father, we thank you once again for your word. We're grateful for this, this week of study that we've had and uh, opportunity to um, renew friendships and meet new people and, and so forth. We pray now in this particular study that as we look at the issue of the sinner's prayer and whether or not prayer saves anyone today in the dispensation of grace, that we'll have clarity from your word and be careful to rightly divide the word of truth. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So the title of my message this morning is, um, Why Prayer Won't Save You. And the responsibility that I've been giving you to talk about is the following. A study of what the sinner's, why the sinner's prayer doesn't save, that prayer is actually a work, and that the Romans passage, that's the Romans 10 passage here we just read from, is aimed at Israel and is not a plan of salvation today during the dispensation of grace. So what I'm going to do is basically just take those three things and just kind of go with them exactly as um, they were given to me to talk about. So my first point then is, what is the sinner's prayer? Now, I'm sure you're aware of this to some degree. If you watch any Christian TV, listen to any Christian radio, you'll, you'll hear a, a, a speaker, they'll be preaching about something, and they'll come to the end, and there'll be some sort of prayer that they'll ask you to either recite after me or repeat these words or say this or say that and it's you know it's it's never exactly the same um it, but there's there's always some sort of common traits that they have when they when they do this and this is sort of referred to as a sinner's prayer uh real simply um an, an example of sinner's, sinner's prayer might be something like lord be merciful to me a sinner take me to heaven when i die something like that uh is, is an easy example where this idea is coming from that you have to say something specific, that you have to make some sort of specific profession or, or do something very specific, is, is they'll use this, these verses here in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. So let's look at those a little bit more in detail at, uh, for a few moments. Look at verse 9. It says that, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, notice there are two things in that verse, okay? The first part of that verse, you have the statement, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, is that verse, if you just read it like it is, is that verse talking about saying something specific about Christ? Confessing the Lord Jesus, okay? Saying something audibly. And then it goes on to say, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So the idea from that verse is the following. If you believe in your heart, what you then have to do is you have to audibly express that. You have to confess that out loud. And if you don't, if you don't do that, you can't be saved. Okay? I think you can see real plainly, just if you just read it, where the idea is coming from just in that verse. Look at the next verse, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness... And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Okay, So in verse 9, you have two issues. And then the two issues are sort of elaborated on a little bit in verse 10. So the first issue in verse 9 is confess with thy mouth. If thou confess with thy mouth. That goes along with the part of verse 10 where it says, um, at the end, where it says, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So there's, there's the idea of you have to, you have to say something specific. You have, to, you have to confess audibly or orally something in order to be saved. That's the concept they're getting from that verse. And then the second issue is the issue of believing. Look at verse 9 again. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. So there, there's two issues there. The issue of belief is elaborated on in verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. 
So I think you can see from those two verses where the idea is coming from. So in other words, you, you, you believe in your heart something, and then what you have to do in order to be saved is then confess it audibly. Uh, what's in your heart, you confess audibly, you make it known, and that manifests itself with uh, repeating something, saying some sort of specific prayer that is sort of uh, making a public confession or statement about what is going on inside your heart. And so that is then used um, as a sort of formulaic way of trying to tell somebody how to be saved. Okay? Um, so the confession, the, the, the confession with the mouth unto salvation is where the idea comes from, that one needs to pray something, say something, or um, utter something specific in order to be saved. Now, the sinner's prayer, just a few things about that in terms of what it is. By the way, how many of you have ever encountered this type of thinking yourself, heard this sort of thing, and maybe even before you understood the issue of justification by grace through faith alone, uh, said this, something along these lines, and you know, thought that was part of your, you know, what you had to do to be saved? Okay? I think a lot of us have been there, done that, especially if we have a, a history in denominational uh, tradition. The sinner's prayer is an evangelical term referring to any prayer of repentance prayed by individuals who feel convicted of the presence of sin in their life uh, and or desire to renew their relationship with God, okay? Uh, If you follow standard evangelical thinking, there's a lot of, of stress on renewing your relationship. And one of the ways you renew your relationship is by praying this prayer again. And so that's, that's an idea that's out there, the idea of recommitting your life and, and so forth. And the sinner's prayer has become sort of a hallmark of standard, mainline, evangelical presentations of what they consider to be the gospel, okay? And the thing about the sinner's prayer is it takes various forms. There is not one specific way that uh, people will advocate, you know, uh, for the sinner's prayer, And this is used by virtually all Protestant um, denominational thinkers or teachers. Um, I'll have some more to say about that in a minute. Now, it's interesting. One of the things I did to prepare is I looked into some of the background on the sinner's prayer. And one one of the first known occurrences of the sinner's prayer is actually found in Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress was written in 1678, and one of the first known uh, written statements of the sinner's prayer can be found in Pilgrim's Progress. And I want to read it to you, uh, just just so you can kind of uh, get get a flavor of what we're talking about here. Now, in this particular section of the book, there's a conversation between Hopeful and Christian um, regarding eternal life and so forth, and what Hopeful is doing is he's recounting to Christian how he got saved, if you will, okay? So I'm going to read this to you. Just, just listen to this. I think you'll find this interesting. So Hopeful says, He bid me to go, to go and see him. Then I, said, then I said it was presumption. But he says, No, for I was invited to come. Invitation to come, okay? That should maybe ring a bell to you. Then he gave me a book of Jesus, indicating to encourage me the more freely to come, And he said, concerning that book, that every jot and tittle thereof stood firmer than the heaven and the earth. Then I asked him, what must I do when I come? And he told me, I must entreat on my knees. That's pray, right? With all my heart and soul, the Father to reveal him to me. Then I asked him further, how must I make my supplication to him? And he said, go and thou shalt find him upon a mercy seat where he sits all the year long to give pardon and forgiveness to them that come. I told him, I know not what to say when I come. And he bid me to know and believe in Jesus, for I see see that if his righteousness had not been, I have not faith in that righteousness. I am utterly cast away. Lord, I have heard thou art a merciful God, and has obtained and has, and has obtained that thy son Jesus Christ should be the Savior of the world. So if you go through the rest, it's, I'm, not, I'm going to stop there because the rest of it is just sort of repetitive, but if you read the story, what, he, what Hopeful is telling Christian to do is pray a specific prayer about 
you know, and, and the result of that prayer will be eternal life. Now, that's, that's in Pilgrim's Progress uh, dating from 1678. And so this, the sinner's prayer is a Protestant sort of um, evangelistic device that dates way back. It's almost 400 years old, and it, it could possibly be, in fact, it probably likely was being used even before Pilgrim's Progress was written. But my point is, this methodology of standard Protestant you know, theology in terms of sharing the gospel is a very old technique. Okay, Now, some more modern sort of uh, demonstrations of it. The next one's from Billy Graham. Billy Graham would say, this is, uh, this is a quote from Billy Graham, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask you for forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. But then he says, I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Savior in your name. Amen. Okay? Now, that's a more modern version of the same basic same concept, though, that's going on back there in Pilgrim's Progress. Another example I have for you is uh, pulled from Campus Crusade from Christ's website. Okay? The, what they're, this is what they say. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Now, if you pay attention at all to evangelistic preaching that's out there, this is the kind of stuff that you hear all the time. They will talk about Christ dying for sin. They will talk about the resurrection. But then when they come all the way down to the bottom and they're getting ready to tell somebody what they need to, what, how they can be saved, they almost invariably mess it up. Okay? And I'll, I'll say more about that. The, go back, if, uh, Romans 10, in 2012, the Southern Baptist Convention reaffirmed the use of the sinner's prayer with the following statement. The Southern Baptist Convention said, We affirm that repentance and faith involve a crying out for mercy and a calling on the Lord. And then they give Romans 10, 13 as their text. Okay? often identified as a, quote, sinner's prayer, as a biblical expression of repentance and faith. A sinner's prayer is not an indication, is not an incantation, they say, that results in salvation merely by, its, uh, merely by reciting it and should never be manipulatively employed or utilized apart from a clear articulation of the gospel. Well, that's interesting, Okay. Come with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, there are probably many problems with the sinner's prayer concept. One of the major problems with the sinner's prayer is that it creates the idea that you have to do something in order to be saved. Okay? So if, if, I'm talk, if I'm preaching and I'm talking about Christ dying for sin and His death, His burial, His resurrection from the dead and so forth, and I'm, I'm clear about that, and I get to the end, and what I say to the audience is, okay, now what you need to do is repeat after me. Okay? So what you're doing there is you're creating the perception that if the person listening does not say what the preacher says or does not do what the preacher tells them to do, that they can't be saved without doing those things, whatever they may be, okay? And because there's no real one standard way that the sinner's prayer is, is used and recited and what have you, um, it's sort of difficult to, to deal with it specifically. But there are some general things that we need to be aware about it. I want you to think about Billy Graham's example and the Campus Crusade example. I'll read Billy Graham's again. He said, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I, ask, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you. Now, does Billy Graham there talk about Christ dying for sins and rising from the dead? But then he immediately follows that up by saying, I turn from my what? Sin. Okay? Do you see how, do you see how he's confusing the issue there? 
he has some information there that's good. He's talking about Christ dying for sins. He's talking about Christ rising from the dead. He knows that you kind of sort of have to believe in that in some way, shape, or form. But then he sort of undermines that in the very next statement when he says, I turn from my sin. Look at, look at the Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. What is the problem with telling somebody they have to turn from their sin? Okay, so if, if, if I'm in my sin here and somebody tells me that in order to be saved, what I have to do is turn from my sin. So I turn from my sin. The problem is, even if I, can I turn from that which I'm dead in? No. So what I need and what these things are not telling their audience and their listeners is that I cannot turn from my sin. If I could turn from my sin, I wouldn't need Christ to have died for my sin. Right? So what I need is not to turn from my sin. What I need is a Redeemer to buy me out of my sin. Okay? And when you confuse the issue and you tell people that they have to turn from something that they're dead in, and that's what they're trusting in, that's what they're relying in for their eternal justification is that they turn from their sin, that's a problem, okay? Because if I could turn from what I'm dead in, I wouldn't, Christ wouldn't have had to die for me, okay? He, wouldn't have, he would not have had to die for my sin. <laughs> so Graham talks about turning from sin. Uh, they'll say stuff like inviting Jesus to come into your life or into your heart. And again, the problem here is that you can't turn from what you're dead in. And any of those models require you to do something and leave you thinking that if you didn't do A, B, C, or D, whatever they're telling you to do, then you cannot be what? Saved. You can, unless you make this pronunciation. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <coughs> now, this verse... Brother Perry talked about it. Almost everybody has mentioned these verses. Now, using Billy Graham again, does Billy Graham talk about Christ dying for sin and rising from the dead? Yeah. But then he undermines it by saying, you have to turn from your sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So while Graham mentions the resurrection of Christ, he still ties salvation to the sinner doing something. In other words, turning from sin on their own. Okay, What, what this verse says, verse 3, look at it close, carefully. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our what? Sins, according to the Scripture. Why did Christ die? He died for our sins, right? Verse, verse 3, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, the Campus Crusade for Christ prayer. I'm going to read that one to you again. That one doesn't even mention it, okay? Listen to it again. Lord Jesus, I need you. Well, thank you. They do mention the cross. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Does it say anything at all about the resurrection? No, it doesn't. When Paul is talking to the Corinthians here, he says, For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What do I have to believe to be saved? I have to believe that he died for my sin. I have to believe that he was buried. And I have to believe that he what? Rose again. If I do not believe that he... So in other words, if, can I believe in the historical reality that Christ was crucified? Does believing that save me? No. Do I have to believe that Christ died, was buried, and rose again? Okay, now, where am I, I want to sort of show you where I'm going with that a little bit. Most of you know I'm a, I'm a high school teacher, and I like to sort of mess with my students, okay? Um, a lot of students come into my class, and they tell me they're Christian. 
And I say, oh, really, what, what, what do you mean by that? And they'll tell me all kinds of things. I've, I've got Catholic students, Baptist students, I've got Pentecostal, I've got all different sorts of students that, you know, coming from all different, quote, Christian backgrounds and stuff like that. And I, I ask them questions to see, you know, what they're going to tell me. Do you know, if when I, when I talk to the, the Roman Catholic students, a Roman Catholic will tell you that they believe that Christ died on the cross and rose again. They, be, they say they believe that. Okay? The problem, though, is that then they, see, the, the, the problem is this. You can believe that, but what saves your soul for eternity is believing that he did that for your sin. Okay? You can sort of believe it abstractly. You can believe it maybe even as a historical reality and historical fact if you want. But until you by faith acknowledge that, hey, I am a sinner, short, falling short of the glory of God, and the only prayer, the only hope that I have is to believe in the provision that Christ made for my sin, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I believe that he did that for my sin, that's what saves me. Just giving mental assent to it, just believing it as historical reality does not save me, does not justify me, does not redeem me out of my sin. I have to believe that, that I have a problem and that the only remedy to the problem that I have is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, recently, my wife and I, on our anniversary, which was um, Jan- July 1st, I got married in the year 2000. And I'll tell you why. That way I could just look at the calendar and know how many years I've been married, see? So for me, it's, for me it's easy. It's 2014, 14 years, okay? But on our anniversary, we went to see the movie God is Not Dead. Any of you seen the movie God is Not Dead? Okay, uh, a few of you have, not many. If you're not familiar with the movie, it, one of the things that happens in the movie is there's a, uh, a, a Christian college student, and he takes a philosophy class, and the professor of the philosophy class is a rabid atheist, okay? And so a lot of the movie is about the conversations that this student has with the professor as they talk about why God exists and all that sort of thing. And what struck me as I was watching that movie is is, is basically two things. The evangelical world is very good when it comes to the issue of apologetics, okay? They are very good talking about the proofs of the Christian faith in terms of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. They're very good at that and why God exists and all that sort of thing. But then why are they so bad at telling people what they actually have to believe to be what? Saved. And I've been thinking about that ever since I saw the movie, and I'll just share with you some of my thoughts because I think it relates to this. Does Satan care if you believe that Jesus was a, was a human being that lived in first century Palestine? No. Does he care if you believe that he was crucified by the Romans? Does he even care if you believe maybe even that he rose from the dead? He maybe has a little bit more of an issue with that one, right? But what he doesn't want you to understand is that the only way you can be justified and made right with God is by believing that he did those things for your what? Sin. And so evangelicalism is very good at sort of getting people to the what I call the edge. So you, you're all familiar with the illustration, right, of man over here, God over there, and there's this gulf between, and that man is separated from God by sin, right? Well, they're very good at getting man to this point, but then when they tell him what he needs to do to be saved, they invariably tell them something like, say this prayer, do this, do that, whatever. And if it's not the clarity of the gospel, it's not going to what? It's not going to work, okay? <laughs> Come over to Romans chapter 4. Come over to Romans chapter 4. See, folks, the... the, the the illustration, when you get somebody to this point, what do you need to tell them? You need to tell them Christ died for their what? Sin. Christ paid all the work. He did everything that was necessary. He rose again. He was buried in proof that he died. Okay? And then he rose again the third day. And when you believe that he did that for your sin, do you traverse 
the, the gulf of sin and receive a relationship with God. Paul says, doesn't Paul say in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says there is, there is one God, right, and one mediator between God and who? Man, the man who? So the only, way for me to, the only way for me to traverse the gulf here, the only way for me to have the relationship with God is to pass through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tom talked about it yesterday, right? When you believe the gospel, you are identified to Christ, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. You are, you are joined to the Lord Jesus Christ, and by virtue of the fact that you are joined to the Lord Jesus Christ, you now have a relationship with who? You are now accepted in the beloved. You are forgiven. You are justified. You are all those things, right? So if you, if you take the person to this point here and you mess it up, you don't tell them the simplicity of the gospel, you leave them with no what? No hope. You leave them with nothing that's going to allow them to become what? Saved. I want to say something about 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because I've thought about this as it relates to my children. Okay? My children can repeat to me that the way they are saved is to believe Christ died on the cross for their sins, was buried, and rose again. They can repeat it to me. What worries me is do they believe it? Do they believe it for themselves? And I think we do need to be a little bit careful about that. Okay, we don't we don't want to take First Corinthians chapter fifteen and turn it into sort of a, a grace, um, you know, uh, a, a grace reading or you know a, a grace prayer, if you will. That some if somebody says it, da, 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 and they can rattle it off. Oh well, they're you know they're saved, they're justified. No, we need to make sure that that we're understanding what that means. Okay, and make sure that we're being clear about what that means and ask some, some follow-up questions. Okay, yes, you can say that, that's good, but what do you think that means for you, sort of thing? And I think we just need to be careful about that. Romans chapter 4, look at verse 25. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. See, verse 25 says, Who was delivered for our what? Offenses, and was raised again for our justification. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we understand that he died for our sin, right? And that he was buried, and that he what? See, why do you have to believe all three? You have to believe all three because there's something very specific that is being accomplished by each part. Okay? Look at that verse again, verse 25. Who was delivered for our what? Where does he pay for sin? On the cross. He, he sheds his blood in payment for sin upon the cross. He is delivered to the cross to pay for our offenses. Right? Right? Read the rest of the verse. And, and, in addition to, was raised again for our what? Justification. That's why we talk about the finished work of Christ. He died, for our, he was delivered to the cross for our offenses, he was buried in proof that he was dead, and he rose again after three days and three nights for our justification. And when we believe that he died, that he died there for our sin, that he was buried, and that he rose again, and we believe that, that, and we believe that he did that for us. By the way, without anything else, that's the problem here with the sinner's prayer, right? Billy Graham will say, "Believe Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again," and then he'll say in the very next sentence, "Turn from your what? Turn from your sin." Okay. So the death of Christ paid for all of our sin. The burial of Christ proved the fact that he was dead and that he had made total, complete satisfaction for our sin. That the offended justice of God against our sin was completely satisfied because the eternal Son of God was killed and he was buried to prove that he was what? Dead. And then three days and three nights later, he what? He rose from the dead. So the resurrection then is the basis of, <laughs> upon which we are justified and given the very righteousness of God. Come with me, if you would, to Colossians chapter 4. So back to the concept now of the sinner's prayer. We started in, get, 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 two, get two passages. Go back and grab John 9 and get Colossians 4. Get John 9 and Colossians 4. Now, I started by just reading you John 9, 31. 
Go to John 9, 31 first. John chapter 9, look at verse 31. It says here, Now we know that God heareth not what? Folks, if I'm dead in sin, and I call out to God it's, it's some audible way by repeating whatever the preacher says and thinking that just saying what he says, repeating after him or, uh, or her, unfortunately in these days, uh, female pastors and what have you, and just doing whatever you're told to do is what, is what saves you, that verse says there that does God even hear the prayer of the sinner? So if you're dead in your sin and you think that praying something specific, reciting something, whatever it is, is going to, is going to justify you and give you eternal life, you need, to think, you need to rethink that. Colossians 4, look at verse 12. Look, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ saluteth you always, notice, laboring fervently for you in what? In prayer. Who's Epaphras? Who's Epaphras? Is he, a, is he a believer or an unbeliever? Go back to chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1 quick. Look at verse 7. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear, fel- our, our dear fellow servant, who is what? Who is for you a faithful minister of what? Christ, who, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So is Epaphras a saved man or an unsaved man? He's a saved man, right? So when you come to verse, go back to chapter 4, verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring, fervent for you in what? Notice, how does that verse describe Epaphras' prayer? He des- it describes it as his fervent what? Labor. Okay? Is prayer, according to, in Paul's thinking, is prayer a work? Pa- Epaph- now, why can Epaphras labor fervently in prayer for the, Thess- for the Colossians? Because Epaphras is a saved, justified member of the church, the body of Christ, right? So if I tell an unsaved man now, the man that is a sinner, the man whom God won't hear, that the way he gets saved, that the way he gets justified is to say A, B, C, and D, not only can God, will God not hear what that man says, now I am adding a work into the equation, and that work, as we know, is going to cancel out what? Grace. Okay? So Epaphras is working here, if you will, a spiritual muscle in his prayer life that only a believer is able to what? Exercise. So if one must pray then in order to be saved, are they not adding something then to the finished work of Christ? Okay. Now I just want to say one thing. I think we need to be careful here too. Is it possible for someone to have already believed and trusted the finished work of Christ before the guy gets to the end and messes it up? Yes, it is. It is absolutely possible for that to happen. Okay? I think we need to also be careful once someone has believed the gospel alone, believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ alone, apart from works, apart from whatever, you know, they think they're going to bring God to help out the situation, whether it's prayer or whatever else. If somebody then says a prayer of thanksgiving to God for justifying them, we need to be careful here about what is being said and what is being done, okay? Because I believe that, that people can be saved by just believing in the privacy of their own heart and mind. If the gospel is, is presented in any way in a message, even if at the end the guy messes it up, does the person have the capacity in that moment to believe the simplicity of what is said, even if it's messed up at the end? Yes. So we need to be careful about that, Okay. We need to understand, though, that we who know better should not be saying, well, what you need to be to do to be saved is to say A, B, C, D. Okay? Because that, that's, that's not going to get it done. 
I've got 13 minutes left, and I want to talk a little bit about then the context of Romans 10. So go back to Romans 10. Romans chapter 10. Now, I want to remind you something I said earlier. In 2012, the Southern Baptist Convention confirmed the use of the sinner's prayer by appealing to Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Okay? So they are, they are using the two verses we started with in Romans 10 as justification for the use of the sinner's prayer as an evangelistic device. Okay? You're in Romans 10, go to Romans 9 first, quick. Romans 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow of, in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brother and my kinsmen according to the flesh. Verse 4, who are who? Who is Paul talking about starting in, verse, in chapter 9? Israel. Go to chapter 10, verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 1. Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Who is he talking about in chapter 10? We know, you know, we understand here, I think, in this particular meeting that Romans 9, 10, and 11 are the dispensational section of the book of Romans, right? Where Paul is explaining some dispensational things that have changed from time past to but now, and he's, he's talking about the state of Israel. And so when you read chapter 9, 10, and 11, these chapters are about who? They're about Israel, right? Look at verse 2 of chapter 10. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, uh, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Now, what's, what starts in verse 5, is a series of quotations in the Old Testament, or from the Old Testament. In Romans 10, 5, we don't have time to look at all of them, so if you're, if you're taking notes, write up, just write down the references. In Romans chapter 10, verse 5, Paul quotes Leviticus 18, verse 5. Okay? Then in verse 6 he says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That, in verse 6, there's a quotation of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 12 and 13. Now, understand, who is Paul talking to here? He's talking to Israel. And, he's, a, and, he, and he's, a, as he's, he's talking about Israel. As he's talking about Israel, he's going back into Israel's scriptures and he's doing what? He's quoting them. He's pulling things out of there and saying, look, guys, the, as, in the, as he's explaining what's going on with the nation of Israel. If you look at verse 8, but what saith it? The, uh, the word is nigh, even in thy mouth. And in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. That's a quotation there of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. Then verse 9, that if thou, who is he talking about here? Israel. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Saved. Hold your hand there and come over to, let's look at a few things. Come over to Matthew 10. Come over to Matthew 10. Now, this issue of confession, who is Paul addressing in Romans 10? He's, he's, clearly, he's clearly talking about the state of Israel. That's, that's, what he's, that's the context. That's what he's talking about, what happened to Israel and what their situation is and why and so forth. Matthew chapter 10, look at verse uh, 32. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Whosoever, therefore, shall what? Shall what? Confess me before men. Him will I, him will I confess also before my Father, which is where? Does Christ tell Israel there that they need to confess Him before men? Okay? Come over to Luke 12. Come over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Now, as every preacher has said all week, the time is going. 
And uh, so I have to make some decisions here about a few things. But Luke, Luke chapter 12, look at verse 8, please. Luke chapter 12, verse 8. Luke 12, 8. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall what? Confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels of... Now, who's Christ addressing in the Gospels? The nation of Israel. In Romans 10, in the context of Romans 10, who is Paul talking about? Israel. So when he's talking about them making confession and saying these things, he's bringing up something, he's, he's talking about something that Israel's already been instructed in, and he's quoting from the Old Testament all the way through uh, Romans chapter 10 as, as, uh, as an illustration. Now, I want you to get two places with me. Get John, I want you to go back and get Romans 10, and I want you to get John chapter 9. I want you to go back and get Romans chapter 10 and get John chapter 9. Romans chapter 10 and John chapter 9. Now, what I'm trying to show you is that that verse, those verses in Romans 10, verse 9, Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, aren't your salvation verses to begin with. Okay? So if you want to use them to justify the use of the sinner's prayer, you are greatly misusing the context that those verses are even found in. Okay? In that context in Romans 10, Paul is speaking about Israel. He, does Paul ever tell you, does Paul tell you in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 to confess with your mouth? And if you don't, you're not saved. Does he tell you that in Romans chapter 3 when he talks about being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation and so forth? Does he say anything in Romans 3 about needing to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and if you don't confess what's in your heart, you're not saved? No, he never says that. He never says that to the church, the body of Christ. When he says things of that nature in Romans, he is in a context where he's speaking about who? He's speaking about Israel. Okay, so just remind yourself, Romans 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart men believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto what? salvation now go over to john 9 so just remember that those verses as we read these next couple john chapter 9 look at verse 22 now again time is not going to allow me to expound the context here i want to point out something though in verse 22 notice the words the words spake his parents because they feared the jews all right we do need to go back to verse 20 verse 20 his parents answered them and said we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. Verse 21. But what means by but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He, he is of age, ask him, and he shall speak for who? Do you get the sense that the parents don't really want to answer the question here in front of the Jewish uh, authorities? They don't want to answer the question, okay? Why don't they want to answer the question? Look at verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared who? The Jews. Notice, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did what? Confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the what? The synagogue. Now, did Jesus tell them in, in the verses we looked at in Matthew 10 and Luke 12 that if any man confessed him before men, that he would confess that individual before the Heavenly Father? And now you have a situation here where the parents are scared to say who healed their son because they're afraid that if they do, the authorities are going to do what? Kick him out. Come over to chapter 12 of the book of John. Now, remember... In Romans 10, you got the two issues. You got the issue of confession with your mouth and belief where? In the heart, right? Uh, John chapter 12, verse 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake unto him. Verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief, now watch this, among the chief rulers 
also many what? They what? Now, in Romans 10, how many things were they supposed to do? They were supposed to, they had to believe in their heart and then confess with their mouth what they believed where? In their heart, right? That's what the verse is saying. Look at this verse, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. So within the leadership of the nation of Israel were there people that believed on the Lord Christ. They, they, were they believing the message of Christ? Now watch the rest of the verse. But because of the Pharisees, they did not what? Confess him. They did not confess him. Lest they should be put out of what? You see how there were some that believed, but didn't what? They didn't confess. And why didn't they confess? Because they were scared of the Jewish authority and being put out of the synagogue. Come back to Romans 10. So hopefully what we see from this, as we wrap this up here in the last three or four minutes, is number one, folks, faith is a work. I'm sorry. (laughs) Prayer is a work, okay? Wow, that was a real screw-up, right? Prayer is a work. Will God hear, hear the prayer of the sinner? No. So if, if you tell somebody that they need to pray A, B, C, D to be saved, are you leading them down the, good, the, 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 the way that will ultimately lead to their justification and belief, or are you leading them astray? Okay. And, num- and, and thirdly, to use Romans 10 here as justification for doing that is a dispensational misappropriation of the verses. Okay. Now, just to sort of finish this up here, um, for, for the sake of time, drop down to verse... Um, well, in verse 14, how shall, he asks a series of questions. Paul, Paul says, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them uh, that preach the gospel. That, by the way, that's, that's a quotation of Isaiah 52, verse 7. Now, verse 16, but they have not all obeyed what? Well, no kidding, because there were some back there in John that believed, but didn't what? Confess. But they, but they have all not obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Okay. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Verse 18, but I say, have they not what? Heard? Yes. Verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of what? So what Paul is saying is, look, there's no excuse for Israel not to have what? Done what they were supposed to. There's no excuse for Israel not to have believed and done uh, what the Scriptures would have had them do. Verse 19, but I say, did, uh, did not Israel know? What's the answer to that question? Yes, okay. First, Moses saith, and so he says, doesn't Israel know? Yeah, they know. How do they know? Moses what? Moses said so. Verse 20, but Isaiah is very, Isaiah is very bold and saith, I have found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Now, verse 21. Verse 21. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hand unto this disobedient and getting saying one. See, what Paul's doing by talking about that in verses 9 and 10 is he's illustrating the fact that Israel is without excuse. So when he begins to talk in the next chapter about Israel being, Israel stumbling and falling and and being set aside and and, and, uh, Paul being made the apostle of the Gentiles in chapter 11, verse 13, and how Israel has to wait to the future in verses 26 and following to be saved and all that stuff. These verses are not salvation verses for you and I as members of the church, the body of Christ in Romans chapter 10. They are, and to take them and make them that, as I said a moment ago, is a dispensational misappropriation of the verses. Okay? You and I are saved by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ the moment we trust the fact that He died for our sin and we stop relying in our work, we stop relying on anything we can do to to try to help God out 
and we trust and rely exclusively on what He did for us and believe that He died on the cross for our sin, was buried, and what? Rose again. There's nothing in there about making confession. Okay? We need to be careful about this issue of the sinner's prayer. We need to be careful about it, that we don't use it as an evangelistic tool. But we need to be careful to do some digging into people that tell you that's how they got saved to try to ascertain, are they really saved or are they confused? Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word, for the opportunity to, to preach it and to be here with these saints. We pray that as we move on through the rest of the conference that we'll continue to be edified and built up in your word. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.